Good morning. It's Thursday, the 24th of October, and this is Govind Rajati Raj headquartered and broadcasting as well as streaming from Mumbai, India's financial capital. The top stories, and there is no take today, and we'll be back with that tomorrow. Markets struggle once again to hold gains as sellers take control. Consumer products giant Hindustan Unilever says urban demand in the country is slowing and reports lower sales. Gold prices hit fresh highs globally. Goldman Sachs cuts its India outlook. The International Monetary Fund or IMF projects a lower global growth next year. What does that mean for India? And India's disease profile is changing rapidly and what that means to you and the pharmaceutical industry. This is a core report with Govindraj Athiraj. The stock market struggled once again. The markets are failing to hold on to early gains as quite evidently sellers are waiting for prices to rise before getting out and that's becoming a pattern of sorts in recent days. On Wednesday the main indices that's the BSE Sensex and the NSE Nifty 50 fell back to close in negative territory. The Sensex fell about 139 points to close at 80081 while the Nifty 50 dropped 36 points to end at 24435. Interestingly the smaller caps and thus broader indices are swinging back up again. The Nifty small cap and the Nifty mid cap hundreds closed with gains of more than a percent or rather close to a percent and 0.6 percent. The result season meanwhile continues to look weak. I'm scanning a little more than normal here just to give you a sense on how things are looking because this is a shift that we are seeing this quarter or the last quarter as compared to previous quarters all of which is not very encouraging. So Hindustan Unilever to start with reported a smaller than expected quarterly profit on Wednesday thanks to higher expenses and a slowdown in urban markets. Profits were down about 2%. Reuters quoted its CEO saying the September quarter for consumer goods demand witnessed moderating growth in urban markets while rural continued to recover gradually. Hindustan Unilever gets about 60% of its sales from urban areas. So broadly, rural demand has gathered pace over the last three quarters, including the July-September period overtaking urban growth, said Reuters. Two-wheeler major TBS motor company too reported a lower than expected quarterly profit on Wednesday thanks to higher costs. One sector that continues to do well is healthcare. Dr. Lal Path Labs, India's leading diagnostics firm by revenue, reported a bigger than expected second quarter profit on Wednesday thanks to continued demand and a rising awareness for health and wellness, said Reuters, adding that its consolidated net profit was up about 18% to about 129 crore rupees and that increased for the sixth quarter in a row. This company operates about 300 laboratories in India and it said its samples, or rather the number of samples it tested, climbed 10% and volumes were rising. Prices of some of those tests were rising as well. More insights into India's healthcare transitions coming up shortly. The rupee, it's a fresh low. The rupee is still slipping. Once again, it's at its weakest closing level on record on Wednesday thanks to a strong dollar. The good news, if so, is that it did better than its Asian peers. So the rupee ended at 84 rupees 8 paise against the US dollar, its weakest closing level on record, as we said, and marginally lower than its closing level of 84 rupees 7 paise in the previous session, according to Reuters, adding that the dollar index was up 0.2%, has now touched a peak of 104.37, the highest level since early August. Gold prices hit fresh records. Gold prices hit record highs once again on Wednesday, defying the dollar's rise, which kept pressure on the yen and the euro. Gold has risen close to 32% this year, and many fund managers are now advising upping the hedge or investments in gold, if nothing else, to hedge against equities. Analysts at Standard Chartered in a note reported by Reuters said that gold has scaled new highs despite real and nominal yields edging higher, the dollar strengthening and US equity markets scaling new highs, which is of course interesting that gold is not moving in the contra direction in some of these developed markets, unlike in India, where there seems to be a divergence between equities and gold right now. But this was not the case a little earlier. There are also question marks on how much the US Federal Reserve will actually cut interest rates as earlier predicted and expected and that's because recent economic data in the United States is pointing to an economy that continues to expand as well as create jobs. Silver is steady meanwhile after hitting its highest since late 2012 at $34.87. Goldman Sachs takes a turn. 
After all the bullishness, I guess it was time for some retreat. Goldman Sachs has lowered India equities to neutral from overweight on Tuesday as India's slowing economic growth weighs on corporate earnings amidst record foreign outflows from domestic markets, according to Reuters. Goldman Sachs has also cut its 12-month target for the Nifty 50 to 27,000 from 27,500, saying the markets could time correct over the next three to six months. The fresh target, however, still represents a 10% upside from Tuesday's lows of 24,472. Goldman strategists said that while they believe the structural positive case for India remains intact, economic growth is cyclically slowing down across many pockets. So what is prompting this not-so-surprising turnaround? Well, Goldman says high valuations and less supportive domestic and external factors, including the Middle East tensions, could keep markets range-bound. They also hoped that a large price correction was unlikely given strong domestic inflows into equities. The Nifty 50 index has lost about 7% since the record high it hit on September 27th after several global funds, among others, moved funds to China, putting out close to $11 billion in the month of October alone till date. But last year, it was a rosy picture. Goldman had upgraded Indian equities to outperform and citing strong economic growth prospects, steady domestic mutual fund inflows, and a potential supply chain shift from China. IMF lowers global growth forecast. The International Monetary Fund has lowered its global growth forecast for next year and warned of accelerating risks from wars to trade protectionism, even as it credited central banks for taming inflation without sending nations into recession, according to Bloomberg. Global output will expand 3.2% percentage points slower than a July estimate, the IMF said in an update of its World Economic Outlook released on Tuesday. It left the projection for the year unchanged at 3.2% and said that inflation will slow to 4.3% next year from 5.8% in 2024. And in India, IMF had projected 7% this year and 65 next year. The chief economist at the IMF said that the risks are building up to the downside and there is a growing uncertainty in the global economy, referring to geopolitical risk with the potential for escalation of regional conflicts, which could obviously affect commodity markets. And then, of course, there's the rise of protectionism, protectionist policies, disruptions in trade. Remember, Donald Trump, if he returns, could impose up to 60% tariffs on imports from China and 10% from the rest of the world. All of this could spur inflation and maybe even pressure the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates, according to a Bloomberg economics analysis, and something that we've been hearing from others as well. The IMF also said that tariffs and trade uncertainty across countries also risks reducing global economic output levels by about 0.5% in 2026. The IMF last week also flagged concern about global public debt, which is expected to reach $100 trillion or 93% of world gross domestic product by the end of the year, driven mostly by the United States and China. The Eurozone is looking weaker than before too. In terms of next year's outlook, the IMF forecast for Eurozone has been downgraded to 1.2%, that's 0.3% lower than July, due to persistent weaknesses in manufacturing in Germany and Italy. Germany is something that we've been seeing or referring to. Italy is slightly new on the radar. I reached out to Madhvi Arora, the chief economist at MK Global Institutional Equities, and I began by asking her how she was seeing these global growth outlook projections through the India lens. So, well, uh, you know, there has been a very patchy growth story. To be very fair, the global growth has actually surprised on the upside this year. At the beginning of this year, nobody was expecting this kind of a growth outlook. So, we have to first credit the fact that the growth globally has turned out much better than expected, which is again led by the US because last part of market was actually rising in a scenario, probably a hard landing beginning of the year. As we stand today, clearly, even with the Fed cutting 50 whips of rates, in anticipation of a weaker growth, that hasn't really played out. The consumer's story in US is still quite resilient. But at the same time, we have seen slower growth in Europe, which is led by Germany. They've seen slower growth in UK. We've also seen slower growth in certain parts of Asia, which is led by China and even Korea for that matter. So there's been a very differentiating growth story across the world. And probably that is weighing on a lower growth outlook. And of course, eventually, there's the restrictive monetary policies in the world have obviously started to show up with a lag, wherein you are going to see a much slower growth than you saw last year, but yet much better than what you expected beginning of the year. So the United States has obviously surprised, as you mentioned as well. And how is that change? I mean, how does that change the equation? At least, is there any historical precedent to say that, okay, if the United States grows, let's say, beyond, much beyond what it did the year before that, 
this is what could happen to global growth because the US does pull a lot of global growth along with it. So I know the US led bit because, but obviously it's the biggest contributor of global story. But for India, roughly a hundred fall in global growth tends to sort of hit us by around 20 bits on our growth. The mathematics that you should keep in mind. Got it. Okay, so how are you seeing the India numbers now? So what the IMF is saying is that this, and let me quote the exact words, that the pent-up demand accumulated during the pandemic has been exhausted as the economy reconnects with its potential. What does that mean? Or what could that mean? So that's what has happened across the world, right? There was a suppressed consumerism which has come back with a rage. There was also a wealth effect which only played out for a certain segment of the economy. In the early part of the post-pandemic recovery, the K-shift bit that everybody knows about, it's a global theme, it's not an India theme per se. Even in the US, it's the urban consumers who are doing very well. There are certain pockets, especially the rural and semi-rural America, which is also struggling. Same is the case with India. We saw the rural-urban divide, which, you know, widened the early part of COVID. And then within urban also, we saw initially the premium segment doing very well. But then there was a catch-up, which was done by the upper-middle class segment, which was led by you know, massive increase in job growth and the salary growth that we saw in sectors like ITPFSI, which is now likely to sort of have sort of normalized. And obviously that on a year on year basis will impact your urban demand. So we are seeing that urban mid-segment demand is now looking to slow. And that obviously is a worry because that had sort of helped the consumption story for India, even when the rural segment was absent. Right. So IMF has said that, you know, we were at 8.2%, it's 7% and then projecting ahead at 6.5%. So is that in sync with what you're seeing? I mean, your own expectations or projections? No, we are looking at a 6.5%. We are much lower than IMF. So RBI is also quite optimistic. But you have to understand that 8.2% is with the GDP numbers are very noisy because it has the net indirect taxes impact. So the ideal way to see is to gross value added, which is the much more stickier number where the slowdown is much lower. You know, it probably will slow to us from 67 to 6.4% this year, while GDP on an optical basis will look from an 8.3 to a 6.5, if all that is a correct number, or even a 7%, a much sharper fall. But actually, the India story is not like a 150, 100 bips or 150 bips slowdown, but it's actually going to be 30, 40 bips slowdown, which is why you should see the gross value added and not gross domestic product, because last year the government actually paid out practically no subsidies. So, on a why and why waste subsidies are running negative while they actually collected least in the modern net indirect, indirect taxes. So the net indirect taxes, which are just to the value add, made the GDP look optically very high. We didn't have an 8.5% kind of a story. We, and neither are we going to be seeing that kind of a slowdown from 8.4 to a 7 or a 6.5. It is more likely to be a 6.7, which is a value add, which will probably go down to a 6.3, 6.4. While GDP will be probably, in our case, in our forecast, we are, we've been very cautious in the growth story. So we are looking at 6.5% versus the... Malvi, thank you so much for joining me. Sure. Thank you. India's changing disease profiles. Disease profiles in India are changing. Very broadly, as we know, with time and prosperity, we now face and grapple more non-communicable diseases than communicable diseases. For instance, in 1990, non-communicable diseases made up about 38% of total disease profile. That number today is over 64%. Moreover, within that 64%, cardio, diabeto, and obesity leads with 66%, while chronic respiratory follows at 22%, and 12% is cancer. According to figures put together by Pharma Research Company, Pharma Rack, in its frequent industry surveys, you might recall that those with cardio, diabeto, and linked conditions were more susceptible to impact from COVID than others a couple of years ago. So in numbers, the breakdown is quite worrying. India is a big country and so are its health problems. Close to 240 million Indians suffer from pre-diabetes and diabetes. Some 315 million have high blood pressure. 254 million have generalized obesity. 351 million have abdominal obesity and then high cholesterol as well. So many of these conditions obviously overlap. So someone with diabetes could also be obese and vice versa. And someone who could be obese could also be suffering from high blood pressure and diabetes. So why is this happening? Well, the reasons range from increased consumption of packaged and processed foods amongst younger people leading to cases of overweight, physical inactivity or lack of activity, and then some old reasons. Some 253 million Indians aged 15 and over are tobacco product users. By the way, that's 200 million males and 53 million females. About 15% of the population in the 10 to 75 age group uses alcohol. 
According to a 2019 survey by the government, 77% of adults experience at least one symptom of stress and one in three are struggling with stress and anxiety and almost 67% of the Indian population lives in areas that exceeds the country's own national air quality standards. So, all of this has changed the nature of medicines and the research that goes into them as well as data is showing and presumably also reflected in the top and bottom lines of pharmaceutical majors. I spoke to Sheetal Sapali, Vice President at PharmaRack and author of this report, and I began by asking her to take us through this disease transition and how that was playing out for India's healthcare industry. So I thought of doing this study because nowadays there is a lot of it is just being talked about, you know, cardiac conditions, people dying of cardiac conditions, diabetes. So I wanted to check out whether it is just the news or it's genuinely increasing. That's the reason why I did a little long-term study for almost a decade. In fact, I looked at the disease pattern, how it was in 1990 and how it was in 2016. That's almost 25 years gap. So 1990, what we had seen as non-communicable disease or lifestyle diseases, they contributed to almost 40% of the diseases and other diseases like typhoid, cholera, so which are more of hygiene-related diseases or seasonal diseases, they were almost 50-55%. 25 years down the line, now the lifestyle diseases or the so-called non-communicable diseases like cancer, asthma, cardiology, well, cardiology problems, diabetes problems, or obesity problems, they are almost 60% plus. And that this report, which I'm saying is around 2016, and today we are at 2024. So probably if I were to look at the same figures today, that 62% would have gone 65% or so. I don't have the numbers with me. But then this, there is definitely an increase in the proportion of lifestyle diseases. So probably as India is prospering, we are also moving towards the disease conditions of the developed countries. That's number one. And number two is, nowadays there is awareness and people are able to afford different treatments. Earlier, people were not able to afford treatments, but today people are able to afford treatments. Then I also try to look a little more details on, you know, what are those non-communicable diseases which have become more prominent. And I realized that it is more of the cardiovascular, diabetes and obesity. They contribute to almost 60%, 66% of these diseases. And that's where the thing started getting interesting. I said that if this is the disease profile which is changing, how is the pharma industry operating in it? And then I tried to look at the different molecules, innovative molecules which have entered the country in the last two decades. So the number was huge. What number of newer molecules have entered or been launched in this country in the last two decades in both the cardiac segment as well as the diabetes segment? And that's the reason why in terms of value also the market has moved up because majority of these molecules, they are patent protected. Okay. So because they were patent protected in terms of pricing, they were premium and uh, the launch was done in such a way that the products were available to a bigger segment of patients in the country. Got it. So, for example, I can see from your charts that in the last two or three years in anti-diabetes, you have semaglutide, which is, of course, what is also known as Ozempic and very popular. Similarly, you have newer drugs in cardiac like Selexipag. And I'm sure in the other categories, you have equally new ones. So tell us about what's changed in the way these drugs are working and the way people are using them. And are they, to what extent are they actually helping solve or cure conditions? See, it's like it's a different way of mechanism of action than these drugs have. Probably the traditional antidiabetics, they were helping the increased production of insulin. Whereas these newer drugs, they prevent the different agents in the body which actually break down the incretins or the hormones which help the production of insulin. So the mechanism of action is slightly different, which probably our current traditional medications may not help. Everyone has got a different mechanism of action, but which is definitely superior to the ones which are available in the traditional way. Similarly, some popular drugs which were launched in the obesity segment, semaglutide, which is actually anti-diabetic, but which is more uh, used in the country for obesity or weight loss. The mechanism of action is they make you feel more satiated. They have an impact or they work on that section of the brain, which reduces your feeling of hunger. 
and you know this it's not very easy to get these type of drugs because it's working on multiple areas of your body it is working on some brain functions of your body and definitely then these medications will be expensive similarly we have products like verisiguat or sacubitril valsartan in the area of heart failure which reduces to a great extent the complications of heart failure which reduces the extent of hospitalization and for a heart patient even this incremental support is really helpful right just to recap that between obesity diabetes and cardiovascular diseases what's the biggest in terms of incidence in india right now i would say actually all are connected i wouldn't say that diabetes is more or hypertension is more because if you are having a condition of diabetes then you would have heart problems if you are obese then you will have heart problems as well as diabetes so the connection is actually everything is connected so if i see in india in this 1.4 billion population we have almost 100 million people who are diabetic today and then there is something called as pre diabetes wherein you know you are not a diabetic but you are the person who will be on the verge of having diabetes there are close to 136 million people almost 300 million people have high blood pressure if you see obesity almost 500 million would be you know somewhere a uh, highly obese or almost obese so the complications are really very high and there is a lot of interconnection so i cannot say diabetes is more or cardiovascular is more and if you were to look at the top companies that are benefiting from creating these newer drugs and molecules or have benefited in the last few years how would you categorize them i mean how many are pure indian multinational what's the mix like a significant number of multinational companies have entered in the market i would say 10 to 12 multinationals have entered the market with their blockbuster molecules in india we have good number of indian companies the top you know 10 20 indian companies have very strong reach across the different cardiologists diabetologists endocrinologists and they have a name they have a name for their quality so a good partnership has been observed between the multinationals and these indian companies to have a better reach of these products in the country so multinationals could actually promote their product to wider masses wider doctors could have reached to a better patient base because of these partnerships and at the same time indian companies could have now more advanced and scientific products so they could actually even access the premium segment or premium priced segment in the cardio diabetes segment today and you're also saying that the value that companies see in creating or innovating drugs in the cardiovascular or other lifestyle disease segment is much higher than all the traditional diseases which are also still there yeah because see, this condition is today for india considered to be a very life threatening condition i would say another condition which would be you know i am saying in terms of perception would be cancer wherein the patient is terminally ill or you know even the treatment of that condition is very expensive after cancer probably it is the cardiac and diabetes which are the two conditions where the treatment is expensive the condition is life threatening but in these two cases it is much more recoverable so if i am able to take medications i can come back i can lead a normal life So why not pay for these medications? Shital, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. That was the core report with me, Govind Raj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core dot in, and thank you once again for listening. <laughs>